Hello, beautiful friends. I am Laurel Bleed-In Maffei with Illuminating Souls, welcoming you to this episode of Sleepy Bedtime Blessings, a podcast designed to help you rest, relax, and fall asleep, all while deepening in your connection with your beautiful team of angels who love you so. If we're meeting for the first time, I am an angelic practitioner, a spiritual teacher, and an encourager of souls. And I do this through one-on-one angel sessions, which are wonderful. We meet over the phone, and each session is an hour long, I start with an opening prayer, and I pull some oracle cards for you, and then we go into deep, soulful conversation. And I will also channel messages for you. And you can book your own session at my website, illuminatingsouls.com, and typically I can get you in within a few days, so there's not a long wait list for sessions. I also offer soul mentoring, which provides for ongoing support as you move through a time of transition or growth. And these start with 12-week packages, and it allows me to sort of get in the boat with you and help you move through a time of transformation And then I also offer a variety of classes designed to inspire your spirit. I'm just now getting my January 2023 schedule together. I'm not even sure what I'll be offering. But if you go on over to my website and sign up for my mailing list, you will receive all the updates for what I have coming up. But for now, the angels and I are here to help you come into a place of relaxation and rest and soothing and calming energies. The way this podcast works is that it is infused with divine love for you. And we'll be together for about an hour. Usually the first 15 to 20 minutes, I share with you some spiritual concepts and I bring the angels in with you. And then the second half of the podcast, I usually will tell you a story or read to you a story or ramble (laughs) about something. And the intention is that this is a sacred and sweet space where you can relax and drift off and also receive love. And it also allows me the opportunity to keep you company. So there's a sweet intimacy to this podcast. And right now the angels are holding you in their hearts and sending you love. And it truly is a blessing to be here with you. As most of you know, I have been using sleep podcasts for years to help me drift off. And usually what I do is I cozy on up in bed. I absolutely love bedtime, so (laughs) I cozy up in bed and I put in my earbuds. It doesn't bother me to sleep with them. And then I choose a podcast to listen to. And I turn the volume down low, so lower than I would use if I were listening to an audio book or a podcast in my waking hours. And that helps me just reach a little bit for the audio and helps me drift off to sleep because it's not an obvious noise that it demands my attention. So I turn the volume down rather low and I listen until I drift off. I also do use a sleep timer that comes with the iPhone podcast app. 
And so I set it to stop playing as soon as the episode is over. In this podcast, the volume will remain constant. There will be no surprising sounds. And so my intention is that we get to be good company for you as you drift off. And I know that many of you listen during your waking hours. So if you are going for your walk or going about your day or driving in your car, it also is a blessing to be with you. So however you use this podcast, it is my joy to be with you right now. So I invite you to just close your eyes and take some nice deep breaths in. Unless, of course, you are driving a car, (laughs) then please, by all means, keep your eyes open. And we'll take some nice deep breaths in together as we call ourselves forward into the heart of God. So as I record this for you, it is early morning and the energy is very, very sweet. You know, it's interesting, around the year 2000, I somehow made peace with early mornings. Prior to that, I had always been somebody who would have to set an alarm to get up, and then I would hit the snooze button. But something about going through my spiritual awakening had me fall in love with the quiet that comes in the early morning before everybody else is awake. The world just seems a bit sweeter. And so usually I'm awake by four. I don't get out of bed that early, but I start joining the world earlier than I used to. And so I really love recording these episodes for you in the early morning because it just feels like the energy is a bit clearer. I had planned on recording this episode yesterday morning, but I got caught up in something and then the garbage trucks were coming by and that's noisy. And then I thought about recording it in the afternoon, but the energy is just different. And so I knew the angels were creating this portal for us to connect this morning. So I just invite you to imagine or feel, receive the sweet energy the angels are broadcasting for you now. The angels are aware of what is transpiring in your life and they truly meet you where you are. You know, some people think that we must connect with the angels in holy and sacred ways. You know, we are trained that God and the divine are based in rituals and performance and it's not that rituals and Traditions aren't steeped in beauty, but we also can be informal in our relationships with the divine. So just wherever you are right now, you don't have to do anything, but your angels are with you. And I'm going to call the angels in now. I love the ritual of asking them to join us. So beautiful angels on high, I ask that you join us here. I ask that you bring forward waves of divine love. That you bring healing light and goodness to each of our beloveds who are here with us now. And angels, I ask that you clear any energies that do not belong to us and that you help clear any fear or doubt or worry that we do not need to embody. And dear ones, just take some nice deep breaths in and release. So 
So when I invite you to come into this space, you'll notice that I often say, imagine. And the reason for that is we can get really caught up in wanting to have some kind of visceral experience that lets us know for sure that the angels are here. But the connection with the angels is subtle. It's not like a Cecil B. DeMille movie. I don't know how many of you remember the movie Ten Commandments, right? Where God screams to Moses, right? And it's very obvious there's a burning bush and the Red Sea parts and you can't miss those kinds of signs. But in our ordinary, everyday life, it doesn't work like that. It's subtle because this is your journey. And so the imagination is an interesting gateway to connect with divine guidance because there is overlap between our imagination and our intuitive center. So when I'm teaching people how to connect with the angels, I will say, imagine the most loving voice in the universe bringing forth a message for you. And I have to apologize for just a moment. There's a lot of traffic noise for some reason this morning. I don't know why. I'll try to edit it out though so it doesn't disturb you. So if you can imagine that there is a 24-7 broadcast of love taking place for you. So if you think about radio stations, right? We all know what a radio station is. And we know that they are broadcasting, they're transmitting all the time, even if we are not listening to them. Why is it so hard to imagine that the angels can do something similar? So when we open our consciousness to these streams of love, we imagine that they exist, knowing that the angels will never criticize you. They will never cause you to feel judgment or shame. They will simply love you as we learn to connect with this language of love. It becomes easier for us to access it. So for instance, I'm going to ask the angels to bring forward a message of love for you. And so I feel them coming in. I imagine them with us. And I feel their hearts filled with so much love for you. And they say, dear beloved, thank you for opening to this sacred space where we can meet you and shine love upon you here And now, you are a big and beautiful soul. You have come here to bring more love into this world. And you are doing so much better than you know. We invite you to receive the love and the healing that we bring to you now. And you are wondering how this message can be for you when there are others who will be receiving this as well. And this is because each message, each time each of you hears this message, the energy that the angelic realm brings to you is calibrated just for you. That although our messages may seem that they are universal, 
the energetic transmission each of you receives is calibrated just for you. And so this is where we invite you to take a deep breath in and give your worries and fears and prayers and wishes over to your angels. And as you do, we receive them with love. We amplify your prayers and we will help to clear your energy field through the heart of God. So just take a big breath in and allow your body to receive the healing light we send to you. Your body is a miracle. It is a blessing. And we send waves of soothing, calming, relaxing energy to your beautiful body. And just allow your body to relax and grow heavier. Allow your mind to grow quiet. You have done enough for this day. And we invite you to drift off to sleep on this cloud of love that we bring to you now. That there is nothing you need to do to receive this except to just be with us now. And as you rest and as you sleep, we will help infuse you with inspiration, with love, with clarity, and with goodness. So just take another deep breath in. And we say thank you for receiving the love we bring to you now. And just take a big breath in. And so, dear ones, I invite you to drift off. Your angels are filled with so much love for you, and I love this idea of the cloud of love. And I love this idea of the cloud of love. So cozy on up and snuggle on in. And I invite you to drift off whenever you are ready. And while you rest, I'm going to tell you a story. So for our story tonight, I thought I would share with you about Hanukkah. This episode is going to be released during Hanukkah 2022. And most of you know I was raised Jewish and I grew up in Skokie, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. And when I was growing up there, Skokie was mostly Jewish. And so many of my friends are Jewish. And I mention that because I never grew up with Christmas envy. I had a few friends who celebrated Christmas, but from my experience as a child, Hanukkah was definitely the more superior holiday because we got presents for eight days. (laughs) And please know, I am not talking about religious um, judgment of what is better than the other. But I mean, as a child, my perception filter said, my Christian friends got one day of presents and we got eight days. And so I'm not going to share with you the religious meaning of Hanukkah, but I will say it is a festival of light. It's a festival of miracles. And the metaphor is that after the temple was destroyed, that there was oil 
to only burn for one day in the temple. And the oil lasted for eight days, which is why Hanukkah goes for eight days. So I'm going to share with you about Hanukkah from the eyes of my childhood, (laughs) because it is such a joyful part of the tapestry of my life. So Jewish holidays follow the Hebrew calendar, which is not the same as the traditional Western calendar. And so Hanukkah would shift every year. Sometimes it would be in early December, other times it would be later in December. But Hanukkah was something that we looked forward to for months. And one of the things I remembered was that at some point in late October, early November, we would get a big Toys R Us catalog delivered to our house. Remember, this would be the 60s and early 70s when I was in the height of my childhood years. There was no internet. (laughs) We would get catalogs. And when the catalogs would come in, especially knowing Hanukkah was coming, my brother, sister, and I would start writing our names into the things we wanted you know, it's interesting when I think about what, what I know about Christmas. Again, I did not go through Christmas as a child. But there's this idea that Santa brings the gifts. So there's this magical component to Christmas for children. And we were under no illusions of that because there is no fantasy component to Hanukkah. We knew that my parents, mostly my mom, would be shopping for our presents. So this was sort of a barter. This was a negotiation. (laughs) These are all the presents that I want. And I don't mean to make it sound like we were spoiled, because we really weren't. But as a kid, it's all about, okay, I want this, and I want that. You know, there's this kind of delightful narcissism in small children, right? (laughs) Where um, we ask for what we want, we haven't engaged a filter yet. And so I just remember feeling like this was an important time of year when the Toys R Us catalog would be delivered. And also the Sears and JCPenney catalogs would be there and there'd be toys in there. And I just remember taking this kind of seriously to go through and decide what I wanted. <laughs> and I promise you, we did not get everything we wanted. And, and I will share with you the gift strategy for Hanukkah that I experienced as a child in just a moment. And the other thing I was thinking in the way it differs from Christmas is there was no sort of morality clause to it. You know, it seems like with Christmas and the Christmas songs, at least, have you been naughty or nice and you better be good for goodness sake or you're going to get a lump of coal in your stocking. You know, there's this morality clause in um, in Christmas for children, right? That you better be good or Santa's not going to bring you your presents. So again, that didn't exist for Hanukkah because it was mom and dad and My parents were very loving and kind, and there was no such negotiation. And we were good kids anyways, you know. My my parents did a good job of raising us. And um, so, so Hanukkah really started when the catalogs came, and we started strategizing what we wanted our presents to be. And so when Hanukkah started, we would get our menorahs out. So a menorah is... Uh, like a candelabra, a candle holder, and it has space for nine candles. So one candle for each night of Hanukkah, and then the other candle is called the shamash. And that is the candle that gets used to light all the other candles. So on the first night of Hanukkah, you light the shamash, and then you use the shamash to light the first candle. And then the second night, 
you add two candles and you, you add a candle each night until all eight candles plus the shamish is lit. So each of us kids had our own menorah and we would get a box of very waxy Hanukkah candles that were like bigger birthday candles, bigger, thicker birthday candles. And so part of the strategy as a kid was deciding what color candles would go in the menorah each night. As I recall, the colors in the box of candles were rather questionable. There were a few colors that I really liked, like the pink and the blue, but there were also some muddy colors in there that I didn't like so much. I don't know why that was, and we all got the same box of candles. I think we must have bought them from the temple or from the store. It was a blue box, probably from Manischewitz or somebody like that. And so I remember being sad when I had to use the muddier colors. Like I had to allocate the pink and blue candles so that I could have them throughout the entire Hanukkah experience. Nowadays, things are different. You know, you can order cool Hanukkah candles from Amazon, right? (laughs) Life is different. But in the 60s, some of the colors of the Hanukkah candles were ugly. And as a girl who cared deeply about beauty, that troubled me. So we had our menorahs and they would go on a tinfoil lined cookie sheet and we would set them up during the day. But in our household, we had to wait for my dad to come home for work before we could light the menorahs and get our presents. My poor dad, because the nights of Hanukkah, we would wait. You know how how if any of you have ever had a dog and the dog somehow knows what time it is and they go to the window and they start pacing? because they know it is time for someone to come home. Whatever that intuitive clock is would get really activated for Hanukkah in us kids. Right around the time my father was supposed to be coming home, we somehow knew it. And we would start looking out the window. We would start looking down the street. It's like, is he home yet? (laughs) Because... As soon as my dad came home, we could light the menorahs and get our presents. And it was December in Chicago, which meant it was really cold. And my dad usually didn't work that far from home unless he was working on a building site in downtown Chicago. My dad was an electrical engineer. So most days he worked relatively nearby. And and this is why I share that little tidbit with you. My sensory memory is that my dad would come in and he would feel so cold to me. He would wear like a black overcoat that was cold. It just retained the cold. And so I remember him coming in and he'd have to stomp off his feet with the snow and his jacket would be cold. And the reason I say that he was likely coming from the office near our house was because clearly there wasn't time enough for the car to warm up so that his coat would be warm, right? So nowadays, if you get in a car and you turn on the heat, it warms you up. And whatever was happening, it didn't give my dad time to warm up. So he would come in and he would be cold. He never complained. My dad would never have said anything like that, but this is just my sensory memory. And, um, and we would just all hang off of him. (laughs) He would barely get in the door and he'd be like, come on, come on, dad, come on. We have to light the menorah. And we would drag him into the dining room. And my memory is that he almost still had his coat on. (laughs) I don't know whether or not that was true, but that's how it lives in my memory. My poor dad, we would drag him into the dining room to light the menorah. And here my dad had had a long day and he never complained. He he just, 
he was such a kind man and he went along with it. And then we would say the prayers. There are three blessings you say over the Hanukkah candles. The three blessings are the first night and the last night. And then there are two blessings you say on the other nights. So you say two blessings for all eight nights, and then you add a third blessing on the first and eighth night. I will not sing the blessings for you. Um, so we would light the menorah, and then it was time for the presents. Like, right? That's the best part as a kid. So the, the gift strategy in our family, looking back at it, was usually on night one, we got a really good present. And then nights two through seven were kind of filler presents. The way I would explain it is, you know, I would imagine under a Christmas tree is one or two really good presents and then other stuff, right? Like pajamas and, (laughs) you know, other things, puzzles and filler presents, right? So the big event for us was always the first night and then again on the eighth night. So nights one and eight were typically when we got really awesome presents. And the in-between presents, it's not that they were bad, but we had, our expectations were set, right? We kind of knew that those were not necessarily the the big ones. (laughs) And um, some of the presents I remember receiving is there was one game, I don't even remember what it was called, like King Tut or something. It was like some Egyptian based game and it had a pyramid and it was electronic somehow, not like the electronic stuff we have now, but like the old game operation, you know, where if you, you know, touched the whatever, the the pliers against the, the metal border on something, it buzzed. That's what I mean. There was some kind of component that this little light would illuminate if you did the wrong thing. I don't even remember what it was, but I just remember loving this game. And we immediately went down to the basement to play because the basement was our dominion as kids where we would play and we had all our games. So I just remember laying on the floor and playing this game forever One of my most profound Hanukkah gift memories was there was a doll called the Chrissy doll. It was kind of a big doll, so it wasn't little like a Barbie doll. Maybe it was a foot tall or something like that. Two feet tall. I don't know. It felt big as a child. And and if you pulled her ponytail at the top of her head, her hair grew. So her hair could be long or her hair could be shorter. Again, we were living in a low tech world so that we could somehow adjust Chrissy's hair was amazing. And of course, whoever the manufacturer was had been advertising this on television for months. So everybody wanted the Chrissy doll and it must have been very, very expensive because on the eighth night, my mom gave us, my sister and I, a singular Chrissy doll that we had to share. I think it was one of my only memories of having to share something with my sister. And it was fine with us. We were so happy because we had a Chrissy doll. And my sister and I negotiated a sharing schedule that I will lovingly call our custody arrangement for Chrissy. And what days and nights each of us got to have the Chrissy doll. My sister and I were good like that. We were good about sharing with each other. And I don't know at what point we just didn't care anymore because any great toy loses its luster at some point. But I would say for probably a good month after Hanukkah, we were still very engaged with the Chrissy doll until, of course, she lost her luster, like all good toys do at some point. 
And I was trying to remember what some of our filler presents would have been in nights um, two, <laughs> two through seven. And I don't know that this was a Hanukkah present, but for some reason, it's what popped up in my memory. How many of you remember toe socks <laughs> from the 70s? They were so groovy. And I remember at some point I got a pair of toe socks that were rainbow colored in stripes. And each toe was a different color. And toe socks were very uncomfortable and highly impractical, but I didn't care because I had a pair. So I remember presents being like toe socks or puzzles or books. They were always things I found interesting. You know, I I was always glad to receive a present. You could wrap up a pack of gum and I'd be delighted because I just loved receiving as a kid. (laughs) And my mom, as I recall, especially when the grandkids were born, my mom loved preparing for Hanukkah and getting the right present for each of the kids. So I'm sure she felt like that when we were kids, seeing how much my mom loved buying presents for the grandkids and We would have the Hanukkah paper. So there's Hanukkah paper, just like there's Christmas paper. And um, and our presents would get wrapped up. And then in the later years, my mom started hosting a Hanukkah party for our extended family. I'm not sure when that started. I don't necessarily have a memory of that happening when I was really little. It might have. But certainly as I got older, I remember my mom hosting a Hanukkah party, which was really just an excuse for us all to get together. You know, our family loves being together. And so typically the holidays that we would get together would be Passover, which was two seders. My mom would host one and my Aunt Jane would host the other. And then we would do usually Fourth of July at our house, Thanksgiving at my Aunt Jane's house. And then my mom would host the Hanukkah party until in more recent years, my sister took over hosting the Hanukkah party. And we didn't go all out with decorations or anything like that. Um, I know some people do for Hanukkah. That wasn't really our thing. I think we had a lit up menorah that we kept in the window, maybe a couple of decorations. But, you know, probably as with all good Jewish families, our focus was food. (laughs) We were food driven and present driven. A typical Hanukkah menu at our house would be, you have to have latkes. Latkes are potato pancakes. And in our house, latkes were always made from the box mix. So I don't have any recollection of my mom making latkes from scratch. I know that many people do, but that wasn't my mom. She would get out this big electric fry pan and she would do the Manischewitz boxed mix for latkes, which are awesome. And she would fry them up in the big electric fry pan that she had. And... Usually there was a kugel involved because, again, Jewish holidays equal kugel. And usually we would have brisket or something like that. And um, I don't know what else was on the table because truly once the kugel and the latkes were introduced, I didn't really care what else was there. And um, and to this day, it's interesting, I, I still have a love affair with latkes. So when I used to go to Jewish delis for breakfast, I would often ask to substitute the hash browns for potato pancakes. And a good latke comes with applesauce and sour cream. You may be partial to one or the other or both. I have some latkes from Trader Joe's in the freezer right now that I may put in the air fryer for Hanukkah this weekend. So I still love a good latke. And I do love the boxed mix, latke mix. So if you've never had a latke, you can either get them at Trader Joe's or treat yourself to the boxed mix. The key is to put in like a quarter inch 
of oil in the pan. You need to use quite a bit of oil. You're not deep frying them like French fries, but you definitely want to be able to pan fry them with about a quarter inch to a half an inch of oil in the pan. And then you crisp them up on both sides and they're delicious. I like mine with applesauce, not so much on the sour cream, but that's just me. And the other thing that comes with Hanukkah is Hanukkah gelt, which are those chocolate coins. And I know the chocolate coins come just non-Hanukkah these days, but in my day, we only would have them for Hanukkah. And they were the gold coins and they would come in a mesh bag. And typically the quality of chocolate wasn't great, but as a kid, I totally did not care. It was chocolate and they were different sized coins. And my strategy was always to eat the big one first. (laughs) That seems to be my strategy about everything food related. Eat the big one first and then meter out the smaller ones. I will say just as an aside that the Divine Chocolate Company, they make the Divine Chocolate Bars that you see at Whole Foods and other upscale grocery stores. They made milk chocolate and dark chocolate Hanukkah gelt this year, which I thought was cool, but I don't eat sugar anymore, so I had no use for them, but I thought that was really cool. Um, High quality chocolate Hanukkah gelt, and gelt means money, so... Hanukkah gelt is Hanukkah money, another way of giving us presents. And, you know, the dreidel, which is a top that you spin, which really gets boring fast, but there were always dreidels involved. And then another part of our Hanukkah ritual was making Hanukkah cookies, which was basically a sugar cookie, but we had Hanukkah cookie cutters. And making the Hanukkah cookies in our house was always a huge deal. You know, my mom, my mom loved being a mom. She was one of these moms that really enjoyed momming. And so she would let us help make the cookies and it would be a mess because, you know, things would get rolled out and there would be flour and sprinkles everywhere. And we would be trying to eat the dough. And I never remember my mom getting impatient with us, which I think is remarkable. And the thing about making the Hanukkah cookies was the cookie cutters were kind of complicated. Not not that it's complicated to use a cookie cutter, but what I mean is the shapes were complicated. So there was one that was a lion because lions are symbolic in Judaism and And I remember the lion being really, really hard to cut a cookie out of because the dough would get stuck in its tail and in its feet. So the dreidel was easy enough to use, the dreidel cookie cutter, but the lion and the menorah were both really hard because there were fine details to them. They were these plastic cookie cutters and you had to somehow get the cookie dough out of the cookie cutter and retain its shape. And especially, you know, kids were not very dexterous. So we would really focus on who could get the best lion cut out. (laughs) And then we would put on lots of sprinkles. Of course, blue and white sprinkles were important, as well as other colors. And my sister, who later took over our Hanukkah parties, took over making Hanukkah cookies So that has still been a part of our family tradition. And she texted us all the Hanukkah cookie recipe. And I thought I would share it with you. So this is the Hanukkah cookie recipe. I don't know where it came from, but this is always the one that we used in our home. And my sister has in writing the best sugar cookie dough ever. And I would agree two cups of flour, two teaspoons of baking powder, half a cup of shortening, a quarter teaspoon of salt, one tablespoon of orange juice. That's like the secret ingredient here, the orange juice. So it's just one tablespoon of orange juice, 
one cup of sugar, one teaspoon of vanilla, and two eggs. So cream the sugar shortening, add the eggs and beat, add all dry ingredients and mix thoroughly, add liquids and mix, and then you refrigerate one to two hours and you don't want to skip this part. The dough has to get chilled. Um, If the dough is too wet to work with, add a bit more flour. And then you work with a small ball of dough um, and you roll it out on a floured surface and then you cut the desired shapes and sprinkle with colored sugars. Bake 400 degrees for 8 to 10 minutes and then remove from the oven before edges turn brown. And the other thing my sister said is that she does put a little bit of orange zest into the mix. Truly some of the best sugar cookies ever and totally a sensory memory for me. So I also thought I would go into my beautiful collection of Jewish community cookbooks and share a latke recipe with you. Because just in case you want to try making latkes from scratch, versus the box mix, then you'll know, right? (laughs) So hold on. Okay, so the recipes I'm going to share with you now are from a community cookbook called Treasures from Our Kitchens. It is from the Sisterhood of Jewish Community North in Houston, Texas, that was printed in February of 1981. One of the things I love so much about these community cookbooks is they were written by these women, you know, communities of women who would bring their recipes and share them with each other. And one of the things that just cracks me up about them is they have an assumption that you have some knowledge about how to cook stuff. (laughs) Because back in the day, as women, we would have been cooking three meals a day and we would have known how to make, you know, a pie crust and we would have known how to fry up potatoes. And so it's not like they give you every single step. So this latke recipe is like that. So here's our latke recipe from Lily Skybell. Four or five big potatoes, one egg, salt to taste, one cup of flour, and one onion grated fine. And here's the entirety of the instructions. Grate potatoes, add onion, egg, and flour. Beat into mixture, add salt, and fry in Crisco until golden brown. And ta-da, you have latkes. It sounds so easy, right? I, I don't know. To me, it feels complicated, even though there's like five ingredients and two steps, but that's just me. There also is a recipe here for Hanukkah cookies. It's a little bit different than the one I just shared with you. Um, I don't know that I'll share it, Um, but you know what I can share with you? A challah recipe. There's lots of challah recipes out there. I have not tried this one, but it's in the recipe book. And so if we are going to have our imaginary Hanukkah dinner, let's make a challah, right? If we're making imaginary food, let's make an imaginary challah. So here's our recipe. One package of active dry yeast, a quarter cup of warm water, which is 105 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit, a half a cup of lukewarm water, two tablespoons of sugar, one teaspoon of salt, six eggs, one tablespoon of shortening, two and a half to two and three quarter cups of flour, one egg yolk, two tablespoons of cold water, And then optional is one cup of raisins because raisin challah is so good. So dissolve yeast in warm water. Stir in lukewarm water, sugar, salt, eggs, shortening, raisins, and one and a quarter cup of flour. Beat until smooth. 
Mix in enough remaining flour to make dough easy to handle. Turn dough onto lightly floured board and knead until smooth and elastic, about 5 to 7 minutes. Put into greased bowl. Cover with towel and let rise in warm spot for 2 hours. Punch down dough and divide into 3 equal parts. Roll each part into half inch strands. Place each strand close together on greased baking sheet. Braid carefully. Do not stretch. Tuck ends under. Brush braid with shortening. Let rise until double in size for 50 to 60 minutes. Heat oven to 375 degrees. Beat yolk into cold water until blended and brush it over braid and then bake for 30 minutes. One thing about challah is my husband loves challah and we had a wedding in Chicago. We, we, got, we got married in Laguna Beach and then we had a second wedding in Chicago in 2006 and at the hotel they had a challah for us as part of the ceremony and it was the best challah and my husband still waxes poetic about the deliciousness of that challah and every challah I have ever purchased since then seems to fall short of his memory of that challah. So we are in search of the holy grail of challahs. And even when I was still visiting the Chicago area when my mom was alive, I would go and buy different challahs and try to find it again and haven't been able to be successful in the quest for the holy holla grail that my husband will delight in. But I did make holla a while back, I don't know, like six years ago or something, and it was really good. So perhaps there is a holla in my future once again. So I don't know if you celebrate Hanukkah, and if you do, though, I wish you happy Hanukkah. I don't know how many of you heard my last episode where I shared with you a Hanukkah story that I co-authored with ChatGPT, but I love the metaphor of being the shamish, right? So just as a refresher course, the shamish is the candle that we use to light the other candles. And there's a beautiful quote that says, be the shamish. And I think for so many of us, that's what we are. We are light bearers. We do our best to kindle light in this world. And it doesn't mean that we have to be famous or we have to be social influencers. We tend to the light in this world simply by being kind, by loving each other, by loving our pets, by being sources of goodness in this world. And I know that each one of you does this. So thank you for being a shamish in this world. I love you and I am so grateful for you. So thank you for letting me share some of my Hanukkah memories with you. Hanukkah was a wonderful time of year for me and, um, and it still lives with great joy in my heart. So happy Hanukkah and I will not sing the dreidel song for you. And listen, as a kid, getting presents for eight days was definitely better than Christmas where you only got presents for one day, but there are no Hanukkah songs that can hold a candle to Christmas songs. I love Christmas songs. And so I will not share a Hanukkah song with you. And I won't sing a Christmas one either. I just have to say Christmas carols are where it's at the dreidel song. Just, just not the best song. (laughs) But Latke's Hanukkah Gelt presents. Awesome. So happy Hanukkah, my friends. And sweet dreams to you. I love you very, very much. Rest well. And we will connect again soon. Thank you.